please do. Good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Dr. Michelle Rosemont. I'm the Executive Director of Retention Initiatives and Campus-Wide Advising. I bring you welcome from the faculty, the staff, campus leaders and administrators, and our special guests of honor. Um, and I'll introduce everyone momentarily, but we are so excited to have you here today. And because I have such a diverse community, if I say good morning in your native language or you identify with that language, just holler back in the call and response. I want to say good morning. Hola. Anybody Sakpase? Anybody from Haiti, my, my homeland? Anybody? Okay, bienvenue from Sprint Speaking Islands. No, assalamu alaikum. No, ni hao. Okay, I, thank you. Somebody corrected me out there. I appreciate that. I had one other language, Dunka. Nobody from the, uh, the, uh, the European uh, nations. Okay, no worries, but thank you so much. We are excited. And most importantly, you know, if you're like me, I grew up in New York City. I want to say shout out and what up, though, if you are from those communities. All right, we want you to turn up because there's a lot for us to turn up about, turn it up. I want to introduce you to a, a senior leader here at IU South Bend who's been part of the faculty and the administration for over 28. That's a, 28 years, that's a major accomplishment. I want to introduce Dr. Chen who is our interim executive vice chancellor of academic affairs. And, and Dr. Chen, we have a, a, a special award for her today. So again, she is a first gen students let me have a hand clap for all first gen people major accomplishments lots of firsts and I'm stressing that today because if you are the first I want to give you the hope and the energy for you to find that inspiration and I want to see you in a stage someday when I'm retired call me back so I can come hear you speak but Dr. Linda Chen is serving as the interim executive vice chancellor for academic affairs she has been at IU South Bend since 1991 beginning as a faculty member in political science with a focus on Latin American politics and comparative political de development. Dr. Chen is originally from New York where her family immigrated to from and from China when Dr. Chen was a year old. She received her BA in political science from Queens College of the City University of New York and her PhD in political science from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. I just wanted to say good morning. Uh, I also wanted to um, say that as the interim executive vice chancellor for academic affairs, you may be wondering, well, what is that job? Uh, and just to uh, the long and the short of it, I am responsible for the academic programs at IU South Bend. Uh, I am responsible for ensuring that students have um, good academic programs to study, have choices in, in their course of study, and sometimes when they have problems, uh, they can end up in my office uh, giving me, um, trying, trying to sort it out. One of the other things I was asked to say about what are some of the firsts, I was the first person in my, in my family to graduate college in four years. Uh, I am the only person in my family that has a PhD. On that note, I would like to uh, introduce my fellow political science colleague, Dr. Jamie Smith. Dr. Smith is an associate professor of political science at IU South Bend. He is from Kansas City, so he is not from New York. Uh, and he is, has a reputation uh, for being a great professor and for being a great mentor to his students. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for that warm welcome. And it's, it's very good to see all of you here. We're going to have a very exciting discussion today. Uh, I think we have some, some wonderful guests, some important topics, and a lot of great advice for you. So thank you for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to uh, lead this discussion. So I'm going to introduce you to our, our four honorary guests today. Uh, and, and I'm just going to give you um, their names, what they do, and how they fit into the historic first theme. And then we're going to hear a lot more from them. So our first guest is State Representative Mara Candelaria Reardon. She represents House District 12 here in Indiana. And she was the first Latina member elected to the Indiana House. <laughs> All right, our second guest is uh, Chris Chung. He represents State House District 15, and he is the first Asian American elected to the State House. Our 
third guest also from uh, joining us from the state legislature is State Senator J.D. Ford. He represents State Senate District 29, and he is the first out member of the LGBTQ plus community. And our local government representative today from South Bend is City Clerk Karima Fowler. Karima is the first African American and the first minority to be elected to an uh, executive office anywhere in St. Joe County. So thank you again. Big round of applause for all of our, our guests. So we are going to do a, a quick speed round here just to get to know uh, our, our guests a little bit uh, and then we'll delve into some some uh, bigger issues so uh, l let's start with you senator ford we'll kind of alternate here um, just really quickly where did you grow up yeah well good morning to you i'm uh, state senator jd ford and i represent district 29 in the general assembly uh, so that covers the western side of carmel zionsville and the west side of indianapolis and i'm um, honored to be here with all of you um, I actually grew up in uh, Northeastern Ohio um, and went to the University of Akron in Akron, Ohio. Um, and my first job out of college was uh, in Indianapolis. And uh, so loved the city, bought a home there, um, and then started getting involved in politics um, and realized that uh, you know, if I wanted to make a difference, then I've got to you know, start getting involved and also run for office, with, which, which I did. And um, so I'm happy to be, uh, to be involved. And since we have so many students here today, what's a little bit of your, about your educational background? Yeah, so I'm a first generation uh, college student as well. Uh, my mom and dad, uh, my dad was a truck driver. My mom was, uh, worked at a senior care facility. Um, and so uh, my grandpa was the one that was always pushing us to go to school. He was a, a school principal. Um, and uh, so I found an early interest in politics because my grandparents were elected officials. And I just remember going out to you know, the bank or the grocery store or restaurant and people would come up to them and say, you know, hey, thank you so much for whatever you, you know, whatever the issue was, you helped the sewers or the trash or whatever the case. And I thought to myself, well, wow, that's a pretty cool job that my grandparents get to help people on a daily basis. So I, I thought about getting into politics and uh, ultimately uh, in high school, I was our junior and senior class president. And so I really enjoyed, you know, leadership and leading my peers. Um, and so I looked into political science um, as a coursework for me um, and criminal justice as well. And I did an internship in the Ohio Senate and realized that state government is really where it's at. I love constituent work. I love working with the people. I love being able to hear a concern and, and you know, work to get a resolution. And so uh, that's kind of how I fell in love with state politics. Thanks. Uh, City Clerk Fowler, where are you from originally? First, I'd like to say thank you all for having me. I'm honored to be here. Um, if there's anyone out in the audience that are local leaders here in our community, would you please wave or stand up? I am originally from out east, so I was born in Jersey. I came here my senior year of high school and I graduated from Riley. Um, <laughs> um, I didn't quite do a lot of things the traditional way. I, um, when I came here right out of school, I went into real estate. I thought I was gonna be a real estate mogul. Um, so I bought 18 houses and managed the properties um, and then went back to school. But I'm alumni of uh, Bethel College here locally. Um, and I got into government um, after, uh, after my run <laughs> with my homes and it didn't go as well as I wanted it to. Um, I kind of went right back to the office that I was in the most. And I thought about all the things that were wrong and I wanted to help. And for me, I, have, I know that I have to do meaningful work. Um, it has to be meaningful for me. So I went right back to that office and got a job um, and moved up really quickly. Um, and I've been in government for almost 20 years. I love serving people. Um, and yeah, and so our other uh, guests are, uh, work with state legislative districts or Senate districts. You are the city clerk. So uh, how does that pertain to who you represent in your job? For the city clerk, I represent the entire city of South Bend. So all the schools that are represented here today from the city of South Bend, I represent you all. 
and um, I am a part of your government. Um, you have three branches. So you have the South Bend Common Council, who I work really closely with, and then you have the mayor and his administration, who I uh, work really closely with. So we're your government, and I'm the liaison between the two of them um, and the general public. So that's what I do, and I'm here to serve all of you. Thank you so much, City Clerk Fowler. Representative Chung, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your, your background, where you grew up, where you went to school, the part of your district that you represent? Sure, so I'm Chris Chung. I represent House District 15 in the Indiana House of Representatives. My district is Central Lake County, like Dyer, Cherville, St. John, Griffith, Lake Central School Corporation, in case you have heard of them. Um, I was born and raised in Northwest Indiana. I was born in Merrillville went to Munster High School and then live in Dyer right now uh, in my district. And I kind of fell into politics by accident, I guess. It was, um, I graduated from college in New York City uh, with a degree in industrial engineering. And then I came back to the Midwest because I really wanted to help my own community where I grew up. You know, I always tell people, you can change your appearance, you can change your credo, you can change a lot of things about you, but you can't change where you were from, where you're born and raised. And that really stuck with me in, in terms of my identity and what I really wanted to help leave the world a better place in was making an impact in my local community. So I decided to come back to Northwest Indiana. I was working for a real estate company in Chicago and the, the 2016 election happened. It, it was all in the news. You, politics was inescapable and I was looking for ways to serve my community. In fact, I, I just started asking around if people were gonna run against uh, my representative, my now predecessor, and no one really wanted to. The, the guys who'd run previously said they didn't want to. Uh, I recruited around to look for some other folks to run, and no one wanted to, so I just said, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Representative Candelaria Reardon, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your, where sure. you're from, your, your, your education? Sure. So um, I am from Munster, Indiana. Um, I grew up with, uh, from a family of firsts. Um, my, my mother was the first uh, Latina statewide federation of teachers president in the country. My father was the first Puerto Rican city councilman. So I grew up with a family that was uh, very engaged in the community, that very community activist oriented. And uh, so it just was a natural sort of step for me to be engaged in the community. But it wasn't, I never saw myself as being engaged in an elected way. Um, I always did things in the community. I worked for uh, U.S. Congressman Peter Visklowski on his staff, and um, I worked uh, for the Lake County Sheriff uh, running the substance abuse prevention initiatives. And then the, the, my predecessor came to me and said, um, you know, I'm not gonna run again. I'd like to, somebody to do, that I can count on to do a good job um, to run in my place. So um, what I didn't know at the time is that he had asked two other people before me. <laughs> and I was the only one crazy enough to say yes at the time. So <laughs> here I sit. I'm in my sixth term. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and, and the question, I, we'll hear from each of you on this, but uh, Representative Candelaria Reardon, maybe you could lead. Uh, our theme today is historic first. Could you speak a little bit about what it means to you to be a historic first in your position, how that shapes your work? So. Um, it's interesting, when I was going to college, um, I was going to a very small private college in Lake Forest, Illinois, and my, like I said, my parents were first. They were always very cognizant of, of, um, of how, how education, but for education, the trajectory of my life would be very different. And so when I was going to college, my mother said, you know, you're probably going to be the only one there that looks like you. And you have to treat the, on this, you know, on the on the education side, and you have to treat everybody with respect. And and I feel like, as a first, you have a responsibility not only, you know, to serve your constituents and serve them well, but to look out for the next generation of people coming be behind you, so that you're not the only one. One of the things that I did was uh, start a Latino Fellows Program um, where we bring high school students from across the state. Are any of you coming Tuesday? Any of you here from South Bend coming Tuesday? We have a busload of kids coming from South Bend. So if you're not coming, talk to your teachers and see if you can come on Tuesday. We're having our Latino Fellows Day. We have a whole day of activities for students. Financial aid workshop, they get to pass a bill, they get to tour the Capitol, meet their representatives, spend the day learning. 
and it's an excused absence from school, so if you can get there, <laughs> please come. We'll make room for you. Um, it's, you know, I know it's last minute, but those are the things that I think, as a first, you have a responsibility to do, is to, to, to think about bringing other people so that you're not the first. It's kind of lonely, really. It's kind of lonely to be the only one that looks like you in the state house, and so um, you have a responsibility to just bring up the next generation behind you, but also, you know, to do things like this. You know, this is not in my district, right? And and so I get that a lot from people. Like, why are you, why are you going to Evansville to speak, or why are you going to South Bend to speak? And I'm like, because my Latino community doesn't have anybody else that will go and do these things and because I'm the only one in the state house. So um, one of one, 150. So here I am spreading the word because I want all of you to think about, to see me or see Chris or see JD and, and see what any of us, you know, we are just like you and we didn't envision ourselves in this role, but I'm hoping that you can envision yourselves in this role. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Chung, we'll go to you. Uh, in terms of being a historic first, how does that shape the work you do? Yeah, yeah. It's cool. I mean, <laughs> it's important for us uh, as a society to recognize that government needs to look like the people they represent. I mean, you hear this all the time. It's been true for decades, probably, that uh, when you look at the, breakup, uh, the makeup of Congress or the Indiana General Assembly or even your own city or town council, the people on there have got to look like the community they are. And, and, and I, as a young person, I, I turned 26 at the end of uh, last December, I, I hope that I'm giving a voice to some of the young people in our state, giving them reasons to stay and move Indiana forward instead of you know, sticking with things that they've been doing uh, for just for the sake of sticking with things and not changing. So uh, as an as a Asian person, as uh, the youngest person in the assembly, I think it's just a, like Mara said, a good beacon that draws people in and says, you know, if, if this moron can do it, I can do it too. So, <laughs> seriously, I mean, anyone can, anyone can run for office and that's what's gonna ultimately, I think, make this country better is if we get people who aren't born and bred to be in this role, but are just average people off the street who are just people who care about their community. All you really need to do to win an election is have passion and, and have a good heart. I mean, you don't really have to have any prerequisite or any, any other thing, and, and that will ultimately make us a better society, I think. Thank you so much. City Clerk Fowler, you could speak to this, uh, how being historic first shapes your work day today in South Bend. It shapes my work in a sense that um, I am very intentional about the things that I do. I serve the community at large, um, but I also realize that I'm in this position at this particular time for a reason. So that makes my work much more significant to me, and so I'm very intentional about making sure I bring others along and get them at the decision-making table. Because when you have people that represent, a diverse group of people at a table that represents the city, our outcomes are better. Um, and it's just a better, it's a better balance in terms of injustices and um, balance of power and structure. So for me, I'm a lot more intentional about the work that I do, for example, I'm the city clerk. When I send out information, I understand that information is power. So when I send out information, I really do my research to figure out how would every person in the city of South Bend get this information? Because I also understand that information is power. So one of the things I did when I first got in office was there are some people that will not use the internet. So I have a column in the city water bill um, in a newsletter. They'll read. But then also, um, some communities don't have internet or they'll not read. We do a lot of Facebook for younger communities. But how do you get information out in a way that everyone has access to it? So I'm very intentional about those things. Um, 
And when everyone has access to the same information, that's when we can start making a real change and a real difference um, in some of the areas that uh, are not equal. Great. Thank you so much. And Senator Ford, um, your, your views on being a historic first and how that comes into play in your yeah. job. Yeah, I, I think, uh, so I'm uh, our first LGBTQ plus member of the General Assembly, so our first outserving member. Um, and why that's particularly important is because, you know, our state um, in the past five, ten years has really made it a point uh, to kind of go after our community. Um, it started with uh, the battle between HDR3 and HDR6, which was when the state General Assembly wanted to put the definition of marriage between one man and one woman into the state constitution. And regardless how you feel about that particular issue, um, I, I firmly believe that that's a separation of church and state. Then we saw uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, also known as RIFRA or RFRA. Um, and that's when uh, then Governor Mike Pence signed into law, um, in my opinion, that businesses could discriminate based upon you know, LGBTQ plus members. Um, and uh, we saw a huge backlash from that. Uh, we saw the, the governor of Connecticut banned uh, Connecticut state employees from traveling to Indiana because we were seen as a backward state. We saw concerts and artists, musical artists, pulling up uh, and leaving our state. You know, we saw conventions such as Gen Con, which is one of the largest conventions for the state of Indiana, pull up or threaten to pull up and leave. Um, and so, uh, and then we saw um, the battle between the hate crimes um, in 2018 and how just unilaterally uh, our members, members of the Senate committee just killed that bill. And if you think about it, uh, during all of that, we did not have anybody in the General Assembly being able to speak out. Um, and so now as a senator, I'm able to you know, see, the, see the kind of behind the scenes of what's happening um, and be able to use my voice and use my platform uh, to get it out there and to show folks this is what's truly happening uh, in our state. When I was elected last November, it was on my 36th birthday, um, which was an amazing birthday present. Um, but, uh, you know, I spent two weeks going through emails and phone calls and text messages and Facebook messages uh, from people from all across our state and across our country, really, uh, but particularly across our state, uh, LGBTQ plus youth, uh, saying things like, finally, finally we have somebody in the General Assembly that can stand up and speak out when, uh, when these things are happening. And so, uh, so, so being a first, it, although very, and I'm sure all these folks would agree, is very honored and humbled to be that, it's also a lot of pressure because, uh, because we know that we are representing you all um, and we want to make sure that we get it right. Uh, in addition to, to that, um, I'm also our youngest member in the State Senate. And so being the youngest member of the chamber, I'm constantly having to kind of battle with my colleagues to get them to understand, you know, that uh, millennials and you all, we think of issues much differently than they do. Uh, and I think Indiana has the ability to kind of be the last state to adopt things. And so I think, you know, we need to kind of change that tide um, and let folks know that, you know, we are in the fight, right? Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm the first Democrat to unseat a sitting senator in 30 years, and the first Democrat to represent Hamilton County, which is predominantly a Republican county since 1913. Um, so yeah. And much, much of what uh, Chris said, you know, anyone can run for office. And so you know, we need you all to get in, involved and pay attention to what's going on in the State House because so much of what we do affects you and affects your family. Um, and so, uh, you know, so it takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of love for and passion for, for government. Um, and, so, uh, and so we're just honored to be here to share our stories with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So each of you um, already answered my second question. So well done. That was, that was good. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, the question was really around your, your journey into public service. And, and, and you all kind of described that. So I was wondering maybe, in addition to that, if, if you could maybe uh, speak to the general um, benefits or uh, pleasures you take from a public service role. I mean, many of our students here today are probably thinking about what they're going to major in or what their careers are going to be in you know, their, the private sector, public sector. So uh, City Clerk Fowler, maybe you could speak to that, maybe an example or something about public service that really makes it a rewarding career choice. 
Um, the thing for me that makes it really rewarding, um, you have to be the change that you want to see. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk about success and they talk about leaving here when they vision success. If you have things that you want to change in your community, sometimes you have to, leave, you have to be the one to lead the way. Um, for, in local government, the work that we do every single day affects your life. Um, and that's what's most meaningful to the work in local government for me. Um, let's see, I will uh, give you some, well, in the industry, um, in the tech industry right now, they talk a lot about disrupting industries. Um, for the first time I heard, maybe a couple of months ago, for the first time, Airbnb made more money than our Marriott's, who have been like top of the line, multi-billionaire company. Airbnb made more money than Marriott's. That's disrupting an industry. And I do think it's important for you to get involved. Because the only way we're going to, I believe, to disrupt the industry is for young people to get involved because the policies that we're making today on the state level and the local level are policies that will directly affect you and your future. So why, why aren't you guys at the table? So it's, I think it's really important and we're not, going, we're not able to create real change unless we have you all at the table. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what it is that would get you excited about government, um, but I, I will have you know if you live in the area or you're not in the area, um, the clerk's office is always open. So if you want to tour or you want to learn more about how your government works for you, um, please come in and see us. Great, thank you. Senator Ford, what about you? Public service, what are some, some rewarding aspects of, of your career? Yeah, I mean, every day I walk into the State House, um, it's just an amazing, beautiful building, and it's like walking into Disney World for me. And it's, uh, it reminds me of the awe of how hard my team and I worked to get there. Uh, we knocked over 35,000 doors, um, sent over 15,000 handwritten notes to people in our district, 5,000 text messages, um, and so, uh, so, so having and being able to host some of those constituents at the State House is very rewarding to me. And same, same invitation that uh, Clerk Fowler just gave. You know, if you're down at the State House, you know, please let me know. I'd, I'd love to, to show you around. And, um, and I think those are the small wins that I truly enjoy. Uh, kind of going back, um, uh, I realized, uh, much like the folks up here on the panel, that the only way that things are going to get better for our state, for our country, is to get you, all, to get you involved. Um, and so I started a student advisory group, and so I meet with um, high school students and college students uh, in our district, and we talk regularly about bills um, that are pending before the General Assembly or just things like that. And, and the goal of the group is that they're going to come to me with a, with a topic, and we're going to research it, and we're actually going to file a bill in the next General Assembly session. And so I want, that's the importance of getting them involved um, because you know and, and the the really the genesis of this idea for me was when i was on the campaign trail and i would call 19 year olds or 21 20 25 uh, year old folks and i'd say hey i'm jd ford i'm running for our state senate and i want to tell you about what i think we can do better here in indiana click or i'm not i don't want to be bothered or don't call me or, or things of that nature and so that to me as someone who sleeps and eats and breathes politics and, and really wants to make our community better, it was very disheartening. And so I think we need to start young, right? We need to start middle school, high school, and get folks involved and, and let them know that, you know, if the General Assembly wanted to pass a law next week that said everyone on Friday has to wear a green sweatshirt, we could do that. We could do that. And there would be no way to stop it, right? Because we're and a super minority right now, which means in the Senate, there's 10 Democrats and 40 Republicans. In the House, it's 33. 33 and 67. And so we don't have the ability to stop that, which is why we need more folks, more friends uh, in, the, in the General Assembly. So, um, so for me, uh, you know, public service, for me, I just love being able to celebrate the small accomplishments, uh, getting an amendment passed or 
uh, honoring or authoring uh, resolutions. That's that's the the small wins that I look forward to. Great, thank you so much. Thanks. Representative Condelaria Reardon, how about public service for you? Well, so um, I too, like JD, I've been I've served for. So my story is that I was elected. I served for four terms, and then when Indiana had the dubious distinction of being the state with the lowest voter turnout in the nation in 2014, I lost my seat, and um, so uh, I had to really have that talk with myself, right? I had to, because I, you know, was very upset and obviously hurt, and I lost by 411 votes. Mm. So um, I had to really think about what it is, why I was there, why I chose to run, and if I really, this was the career that I chose to, to serve the public and be a public servant, then I needed to get over myself pick myself up, dust myself off, and go at it again. And I did, and I won by 2,500 votes when I came back to the General Assembly. So in the last four years, I've been able to win by 2,500 votes when they gave a blank check to my opponent for a half a million dollars. Wow. And um, they just shook out their sofa cushions over there and said, here's a half a mil. <laughs> so um, I won by 2,500 votes. My next, the, two years later, I, I won in an unopposed race. They didn't even put anybody up against me. And then I became elected caucus chair, which is I'm elected by my peers to be the chair of the caucus and run the, the caucus um, business. And so that's the last four years. But those four years wouldn't have happened had I not decided that this is what I wanted to do. I needed to to examine why I wanted to serve the public. And one of the examples, I mean, one of the things that um, I was able to do in 2008, in Northwest Indiana, my community was hit by severe flooding, where the Borman Expressway was closed down for three days. We had uh, people riding down the street in boats. Um, 6,000 businesses and homes were, people you know, in homes were displaced. And so um, we, worked really hard to get included in the budget a 14 million dollar appropriation to fill, finish a levy project that had been languishing for 30 years being, being underfunded by the general assembly so that's a real life example of how we can be impactful right we i if i had not been on the committee on ways and means i would not have been in a position to try to advocate for 14 million dollars for my community those are the real life um, examples of how we can be impactful and at that time we were in the majority and is, it was still very difficult because the Senate has always been Republican dominated and so it didn't matter whether the House flipped back and forth and we were in charge in the House you still have to get both bills through each chamber and so I had to convince 149 other people why we needed 14 million dollars in our community and you know, we were able to we were able to get included in the budget, but those are the kinds of things that that make public service meaningful, right? And I know that there's to me there's two different things. There's politics, which I love too. I mean, I like a lot about it. There's a lot of things I don't like about it, like when you know little kids uh, hear things at the dinner table and they call my kids names on the bus. <laughs> You know those kinds of things. Um, you know because their parents don't like my politics, they you know. Uh, target my kids that's not the fun part of politics but you know the being engaged the race going door to door that's amazing I love that being able to connect with people at the door public service is what we do every day and the moment that I'm elected I'm not a Democrat anymore I have to represent everybody that is in my district not only the people that vote for me and that's really where I think politics gets a bad name because a lot of the people, a lot of our colleagues don't feel the same way. Yeah. They, vote against, they vote against what a lot of their community wants. It may not be the majority of their community, but certainly you know, we're seeing it with public schools and how public schools are being underfunded. You're seeing it, you know, the, the urban schools are in the same boat as the, as the rural schools right now. They're all being under, underfunded because to you know in deference to charter schools and vouchers that's the truth and so i'm hoping that 
they too will rise up and recognize that they represent everybody at some point. Thank you. So why public service? Like I had said, I got my degree in industrial engineering and then was working in real estate and people are like, how the hell did you get into politics? Like this is, I'm just kind of going all over the place. And basically, um, not only did I fall into it by accident, but when I, w I remember when I was your guys' age and we would go to DC for a class trip or go to our congressman's office for uh, to, to see what was going on, and my God, I was so bored. I was just like, this dude, well, you should be in a nursing home, not, the, not making the highest laws of the land. So, well, and, and I love Congressman Vesposka. That was not directed towards him directly. But, but you know, you, you, get, you see who represents you, and you're just like, you know, I, I don't feel a connection here. I don't feel like you're looking out for me and my neighbors. I feel like you're looking out for your biggest donors or you know, the, the people who have the lobbyists who have the seats at the table. You know, these are things that when you look at politics, you have got to make sure, again, going back to my other response, it has to look like us. And the fact that I'm, you know, little old me, I'm just one out of 150 being able to try and shine a light on some of the more nefarious, more despicable things, and also some of the really, really good things that, that we do in this, for the state of Indiana. That's where I feel like I'm able to make the most impact. So that, the, the um, disappointment in who my elected officials who represented me, who they were, and how, and my hope as how they could be even better was really the best motivator for me to be in, pu in public service. So. Great, thank you so much. So I'll ask one more question of each of you, and then I believe we'll have time for some questions from, uh, from uh, the, the audience. But um, building a little bit, a little bit off of um, what you were saying just before uh, Representative Condelaria Reardon, uh, in terms of connecting policy to our, our guests here today, we have main majority high school students here, we have uh, some college students. You've developed an expertise in fiscal issues, monetary issues in, in your time in the State House. Could you, maybe, could you speak to how the things that you work on uh, affect all of us in here, specifically high school students and, and the communities? Well, like I said, for most of my career, I spent my time on Ways and Means. When I was elected uh, to leadership, I let somebody else take that role on Ways and Means, but I spent you know, the last decade or so um, working on fiscal issues. And, and there isn't anything in the budget of the state of Indiana that doesn't touch every single one of you. Whether it's school lunches, whether it's public, uh, public school funding and vouchers, we talked about that a little bit already, whether it's, um, you know, uh, funding road construction, you know, uh, state roads. There's everything in the budget touches your life on a daily basis, and that's why you have to look at what they're funding. Did you know that we actually fund, as uh, we ha have a line item in the budget that funds the horse breeding program for the race tracks, for, for horse breeders that provide horses to the race tracks. Did you know that? That we actually fund that. Why? Why is that? Why are we supplementing somebody's business of horse breeding? There's a line item in the budget. There's a whole host of things that you don't know that go into the budget. And those are the things that affect your daily life because every dollar they're giving to the horsemen, they're not giving to public education. And that's why we have to be vigilant. That's why we have to be vigilant. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Chung, you, uh, in your time in the, in the State House, you've been focusing on local government, local governance. You're on the local government, you're the, the ranking member uh, on the local government committee. Um, could, could you uh, connect your work there to, to all of us here and our students today? Yeah, so every bill goes through a committee. It's assigned by the Speaker of the House to go to a, a germane committee most of the time. Uh, and, in, and anything that has to do with the powers that the state of Indiana grants to any local level of government, whether it's mayors, clerk treasurers, city council, town council, all of those, we have the power to decide what they can and can't do. And any matters that change any of those come through our committee. As the ranking minority member, I basically wrangle up our, our members and make sure that they know the ins and outs of the issues. They know how the advocacy group for cities and towns feels. They know how their own city and town uh, in their own districts feels. They know how the counties feel about the issues. Those are the kind of uh, the interfaces we, we have to be on top of as members of those committees. And uh, one of the bills that I, I co-authored uh, helped, and helped one of our representatives, Cherish Pryor, work on, it's, it's, it's a really simple issue, actually. Back at the last election, 
one of the um, local township trustees' offices uh, had been knocked out in an election, and a new person came in. Now, the old person refused to give the key to the office to the incoming person, or some childish thing like that. They weren't handing over data. They weren't. There wasn't a smooth transition of power there, and it was all really. It should have been codified into law that you cannot do this, or you get penalized uh, in order to keep the government running smoothly. So that was one bill that uh, Representative Pryor and I co-authored to make sure that that doesn't happen. It's a common sense solution. It's just solving problems back home, basically. And the thing I will say about local government committee is that it's a very bipartisan committee. Everyone at home has Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Green Party, whatever. They have to report to them back home. So the fact that we have that consensus and we have that diversity at the table of not only viewpoints but also party helps us uh, make better decisions that work out for everybody. So that's what I've been working on. Great. Thank you. City Clerk Fowler, your, uh, one of your areas of expertise and thing you've been really uh, working on is, is reviving the Youth Council here in South Bend. Could you speak a little bit about that work and how it connects to us? Yes. Um, so the mayor's office has a youth task force, which is awesome. Um, and they do a lot of things with the mayor and initiatives. Um, I'm the clerk of the council. Um, so the council has youth council, which has been inactive. So we're working on revitalizing that. Um, and one of the reasons is because we realize that you guys are the future and we have to get you involved. The council's at the table and they're making decisions every single day. If the mayor brings them an idea or a piece of legislation, they ultimately have to review it and sign off on it. And so they want to make sure that they are including you all too. But for me, I am more of, I'm a transparency advocate because I understand how important information is and that everybody gets information like I was talking about earlier in a diverse way. Um, we transcribe our um, notices in Spanish um, just to make sure everyone gets everything. So for me, it's more about, I want you guys to know how your local government works, what we're doing what we are doing for you and what we're not doing. I want you guys to be able to hold us accountable. So for me, it's more of an educational piece, and I want to bring you guys in the fold, not only so that you can help us make decisions for your future, but also so that you're informed on what's going on. So for me, it's more of an educational piece. Um, and, like I said, to get you all involved, because we need you. You guys are the future. And times have changed. We need your voices. We really do, we need your voices. And when we talk about, earlier I was talking about disrupting industries, the only way we're gonna be able to do that is if we have your voices at the table. So that's why the youth, uh, bringing back the uh, youth council is very important. And one of the things in the youth council, um, and I, I think you brought this up earlier, but <clears throat> per our municipal code, one of the things that's in the youth council that group actually gets to create a piece of legislation in the city and the, and the council will pass that piece of legislation. Um, so I'm excited about it. Wonderful. And Senator Ford, yeah. you have been working specifically on areas having to do with payday loans and also elections um, in the legislature. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how it could come back to affect high school students and, and the community? Sure. I mean, right now the payday loan industry, which, by the way, is not even headquartered in the state of Indiana. So these are outside companies, in my opinion, that are preying off of our neighbors. And so what happens is, is that uh, lots of folks live paycheck to paycheck, right? Um, their battery of their car breaks down. They don't have an extra 500 bucks to go to a commercial loan like Chase and, and take out a loan. So they turn to the payday lenders to get the quick cash. The problem, though, is that the payday loan lenders have a five, 400 APR percentage rate, um, which essentially they suck it out of your bank account, um, and then you continually have to keep paying, and you're, and you're in this spiral of having to try and pay them off. And it's, and it's difficult because on one hand they need the money, but on the other hand, uh, they're in this spiral uh, of paying off 500 bucks, and then which leads to another 500 bucks, which then leads to another 500 bucks. Uh, and so, uh, so these out-of-state companies are profiting off of our neighbors, and I think that's wrong. 
And this was the only issue in the state Senate that brought Republicans and Democrats together. Uh, and it barely passed the state Senate by a vote of 26 to 23. Uh, so, uh, so right now it's over in the House and my colleagues are currently debating that. Um, but this is an issue that you should pay attention to because this is millions and millions of dollars that these companies are making off of us. And, and I don't think that's right. And I think we need to you know, continue to use our voice and speak out on that. Uh, elections, uh, redistricting reform, uh, also known as gerrymandering, also known as politicians drawing the maps to favor them in their districts, right? And so the reason why the state Senate is 10 Democrats, 40 Republicans, 67, 33, is because the Republicans are currently in office drawing the maps to favor them, right? And to be fair, to be fair, Democrats did this too when we were in power. Um, so, but it takes elected officials to have the political fortitude to stand up and say, we need the, to include the public in drawing these maps. We need to be able to draw them fairly. Um, and we are running out of time because 2020 is when the next census will happen and 2021 is we're gonna draw the maps. And I'm, I'm afraid that we will have maps uh, that will be in uh, the Republican power for the next 10 to 15 years. If I could and, just jump in on that. You yeah. mentioned the census, which is a really important thing. And one of the things that, that, you know, the maps are drawn based on population, right? They're based, based on population shifts. And so one of the things I just want to say to you all is to make sure that you or your parents fill out that census form. Because that's how the federal government determines how to allocate resources to our states. That's road money, education money, all kinds of different, you know, whether FSSA. That's how we determine how much money that, of our tax dollars that we already send to Washington, how much of it we get back based, is based on making sure we count everybody in our state, documented or undocumented. Everybody in our state needs to be counted. So make sure there's an online form make sure that you get counted in 2020. It's essential for our state. And it's essential to be able to impact those maps in the long term. And also, too, how much rep representation you get. Uh, according to how many people are in the population, you, it can be a matter of a couple of hundred people, and that will determine whether you get two people to represent you or one. What would you want? You'd want two, right? We've already lost congressional seats because of it. We're not a high growth state, so we make, need to make sure that everybody that is here gets counted. Could, yeah, uh, just one more questions. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the last thing that I think all of us agree up here is uh, the fight of the hate crimes legislation here in our state um, and uh, what's going on in the state house because that ultimately affects all of you here in the, in the room today. Great, so we have some questions. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, I'd like to invite at this time Sherry Pete up to uh, the podium to read her uh, proclamation that she has. Oh, no proclamation. <laughs> to come up to the podium and share, share with us, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Sherry Pete, and I serve as the Director of Community Outreach for the Office of Mayor Pete. Mayor Pete wishes he could be here, but he sends the other Pete in his stead. I'm going to be really brief. I just wanted to offer a welcome remarks on behalf of the mayor and to say that I am in complete awe of the work that you do, and I want to thank you on behalf of Mayor Pete for the trail that you're blazing before this next generation. So thank, thank you, you and welcome. Thank you. Right, so we have time for a few questions. Okay, so my name is Jessica and I go to John Adams High School. Okay, and so my, I wrote it down, so it might be a little Great. Long. Okay, so as a growing generation of diversity, whether it be race or belief, I've noticed that many of my peers are kind of scared to share um, their opinions on the government and um, what's going on in it, so. My question is, how should we as a community start reaching out to my generation to stimulate interest? Okay. I, I can take that. So I mean, so I mean, I, I as 26 year old, I graduated in 2011 from Munster High School, and that was 
that's the issue of our time with our generation is that people are so damn apathetic and they don't care about anything. All the stuff that we're doing is super impactful in many different ways um, and, and I'm not just saying that, it really is. Um, and, and the fact that if we don't get people voting, if you don't get your friends registered to vote, if you don't read your newspaper about what local issues are going on, if you don't seek out those candidates who will best represent you, then you're on the menu. You're not at the table in terms of negotiating. So it's absolutely a, a key issue that we're working on. One thing we did during our campaign was we not only registered tons of voters, but also talked to them about early voting because they weren't even aware you could vote in Indiana 30 days before, any of the 30 days before uh, election day. There are er usually early voting sites in your county that you can go to and, and you can Google people before if you do your absentee ballot as well. There are lots of ways to get around this, but it's just that apathy that you mentioned that we're fighting every day. And I think with technology, today there really is no excuse to not be informed I mean there everything that we do at the General Assembly is webcast live everything we do is webcast live and a lot of it's pretty boring but. it is I mean it, it can be pretty boring it's probably the only time of the week that you know my husband gets to see my face so he tunes in but um, you know there's there's ways to be informed about about things what I'm saying is you know back when I was in high school there was no which internet, wasn't that long ago. which was a long time ago. There was no internet, if you can imagine a world without the internet. There was no internet. We had to write papers by going to the library and making cards and, you know, I mean, it wasn't... So there's really no excuse, I think, to not be informed. You have technology at your fingertips. Read. Inform yourselves. Just, just by a show of hands today, how many of you know who your state representative and your state senator is? Raise your hand. Okay, so this is, this is the problem, right? And so uh, here's, a, here's some homework for you. So IN.gov, find your legislator. You can plug it into Google. You would literally plug in your home address, and it will spit out who your state senator is and who your state representative. You need to be able to know who they are. Uh, their phone numbers and their email addresses are also going to be located there. I encourage you today to do that and to reach out and just say, hello, I'm a high school student in your district and I want to talk to you. That's it. That's all you got to say. And we'll see if they respond back to you. If you live in my district, you get an immediate email back. Anytime I see a high school student reach out to me, it's always an email back. The other thing I want to do uh, real quick um, is, is also mention, um, for a quick plug, follow us on social media. Um, on my, on my social media, I kind of take the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez approach um, and really kind of peel back the, the curtain to show you what it's like to be a senator in our state government, right? To show you what a caucus means, to show you what a committee means, to show you the shenanigans that our Republican colleagues do uh, when they take a bill out of one committee and put another committee because they know they don't have the votes and pass it through and ram it through, right? So, uh, so do follow us because we share a lot of information there as well. UX. How do you get yourself and your peers involved? Um, I would say locally, you can reach out to a, any council member. You can reach out to the clerk's office. Um, all the information on all your elected officials is in the clerk's office. You can reach out to me. We do free internships. The council does internships. The mayor does internships. And every department in, our, um, in your local government pretty much does internships. So if you ever want to get involved, um, you're more than welcome to reach out. But also, um, you can do an internship program. Come to a council meeting. Mm -hmm. We have council meetings twice a month. Come to a council meeting or a committee meeting and bring a friend with you. Um, sometimes you don't see what you want to see and your friends are not willing to get involved. Like I said earlier, sometimes you have to be that person. So. The information is there, and you're more than welcome to get involved. During your uh, high school years, did you ever like imagine yourself being going into politics or the position you are, you're in right now? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, I did not. I did not. I did not know. I mean, I had no idea that I would end up here. And I think that that's sort of what I tell my kids. Um, that come to the Latino Fellows Program, that I, t I tell my own kids, that education, it's like medicine for your life. 
because you don't know what path your life is going to take, and you just have to be prepared for opportunity. You have to be prepared for opportunity. Had I not been prepared for the opportunity when my predecessor came and said, I want you to run, and I had not been prepared, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So prepare yourself for opportunity. Not everybody knows what they want to be when they grow up at 18. I'm 54 years old. I had no idea at 18 that I was going to end up being a state legislator. There's no way. And so I just say prepare yourself for opportunity because you don't know what winding road you're going to take when you begin your career. Same. No way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wouldn't say no way, because I've always been an advocate for people. So um, ultimately, um, any careers where I was going to have to advocate and be a voice for people would have made sense for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously had thought about it with my grandparents being in public service and um, knew that that would be an option. Um, when I got elected last November, it was just so surreal, and I still remember that uh, moment when I found, first found out that I won. Um, but you know, I think kind of going off of what you know, Representative um, Reardon said is, um, you know, you prepare yourself for opportunity and seize those opportunities. Don't be afraid to send that email to your elected official. If you're at a town hall, don't be afraid to walk up and introduce yourself and say hello. And, and share what your concern is, share what's on your mind. And if you haven't thought about concerns, just take five minutes, or 10 minutes, and just think about something that you're really passionate about and, and, and seize it and go for it. And I would just add that, that um, women in this room, listen up, women <laughs> are asked to run probably five times or seven times, I heard, before they consider running. Men don't wait to be asked. Men don't wait to be asked. They, are, they see themselves as, why not? We need to see ourselves that way, ladies. Why not? Don't wait for somebody to come ask you. Don't wait for somebody to come ask you. And I also tell my kids in the Latino Fellows Program that a lot of life, a lot of li things in life are not always what you know because we see a lot of that in our General Assembly because a lot of them don't know a lot. But it's about, it's about who you know. And now That's all of true. you here today know us. Yes. Don't hesitate to call us. Yeah. I have a stack of cards here. You need letters of recommendation for college. You need to find an internship. You want to come to my Latino Fellows Program on Tuesday. Bring yourself down there. Here's my card. Call me. My phone number is here and on the internet. So please, now you know us. Use us to your benefit. These are the contacts that will change your life. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. So there is a group from my, not my hometown, my adopted hometown, Goshen High School. Is there any Goshen people in the house? There they are. So, woo! So Goshen is very familiar with um, former Senator Mike Delph yes. because there was a relationship with a group in Goshen called Sile, mm. and it was a very, very, very anti-immigrant group. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to have to go up against very, I would say, very engaged but a very small minority of people who then have an overarching impact on the quality of lives for immigrants in our community. I'm assuming that's directed to me. Yes, please, JD. <laughs> well, and there might be other instances that that the rest of you have come across that's similar. The Goshen group, we just happen to be very familiar with the Sile group and their relationship with Senator, former Senator Delph. Yeah. Uh, a couple years ago, my predecessor predecessor held what I would consider kangaroo court at the State House um, in regards to immigration hearings. He had six or seven immigration hearings. He flew in some of these ridiculous people from all across the country to come in here and testify that immigration is the reason for terrorism, right? And, uh, and so not only was that a mockery of the State House, and that was wasting your time and your taxpayer dollars. And so, that was a complete disaster, and everyone at the State House knew it, 
right? Um, this is what I can share with you, Goshen folks. This is what happens when people get angry. They get tired of these people wasting our taxpayer dollars and our time, and they come together and they work their butts off. And that's what the Latinx community did for me uh, to get me elected, right? Because they saw him and they saw the attacks, the continued attacks that they had on the community, and they said, you know what? Enough is enough. And so what we did is we hired an outreach director, uh, Guadalupe Pimentel Solano, I don't know if you know her, but she was huge, she was an outreach director for me, particularly to that community. Um, and so we went on uh, the different you know, radio stations and the different television stations, um, and we got our message out there. Um, and we made phone calls to the community. We sent, most of my literature was in Spanish. Um, and, and again, this is, this is important to know, is that if, if there is somebody that's targeting your community at the state house, then go work for a candidate who is gonna take that person out, right? And that's what uh, the community did for me to help get me elected. Can you also yeah. talk a little bit about, about the fact that you weren't, it wasn't your first time, that you, it took you, oh, you sure. had to chip away at it, yeah. you know, and, and you're not always successful. Yeah, so I, I actually lost my first time running for, uh, for the state senate. In 2014, one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life was stand before my friends and family in 2014 and say that I didn't make it. And the worst part about that was that on the television election night, there was a, some machines broken in Carmel. Um, and so at that very time, I was in the lead. But I had, I had known that the machines were broken and the machines were in Carmel, which typically was Republican. And had they count those ballots, it would have put my opponent over the edge, right? And so everyone was calling me and texting me and saying, you did it, I can't believe you did it. But the next morning we woke up to the news. I had already known that night, but next morning you know, I woke up to you know, news of me losing. And again, that was so difficult. But you know what, it wasn't personal for me. It wasn't personal. I knew that I needed to get out there and continue to work hard and prove myself to the voters that it wasn't personal. And so I showed my face for the next four years, every single community cleanup I could possibly get to, uh, to show them that I was worthy of being elected to this uh, position. And so my story is about perseverance and persistence. And I encourage all of you to take, it, to take that with you today, is, is that if a door uh, is shut in your face, find another way. Find another way, because um, I would not be a member of the legislature if I would have just said, okay, that's it, I'm done. Uh, I, I found another way, so. To piggyback off what he's saying, um, for the question earlier from the guy here, from Adams, I believe, that's the other thing you can do. If you have something that you care about, you, your family, your friends, if you know someone that's running a campaign, get on their campaign and work for them. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that you can do. Yes, involved. absolutely.